These students are protesting against a Canadian icon. They say the RCMP didn't investigate serious allegations against John Furlong, and he shouldn't have been invited to speak here. John Furlong has allegations hanging over him that, contrary to what he has argued, have not been fully investigated by the RCMP or contended with in the courts. The former CEO of the Vancouver Olympics and Paralympics is considered an icon and champion of Canadian sport by some. But an article published in Vancouver's Georgia Strait questioned his past work history and sparked a three-year epic battle with journalist Laura Robinson. Two defamation suits, two careers tarnished. This has changed my life profoundly. I, uh, uh, as I said, it, it made me sick and it, it kind of made me permanently sick. You know, I have really serious digestive problems. Finally, this decision from a BC judge ended Robinson's court action and Furlong discontinued his. Justice Catherine Wedge wrote, this case concerns a journalist who wrote about a well-known citizen and criminal acts of child abuse he is alleged to have committed some 40 years ago. Those allegations from former students are still dogging Furlong, who denied them. I feel that my character has been recklessly challenged. Furlong sued Robinson. I want you to know that I categorically deny absolutely any wrongdoing. Robinson countersued and tried to get the former student's stories on the record. Quote, eight of the individuals had things to say about Mr. Furlong. Seven alleged they were physically abused by him, and a few said they were the target of racist comments by him. End quote. Although some of the students sued Furlong, none of those lawsuits were pursued. Glennis Kirkmeyer is a graduate of the University of British Columbia. When she heard the athletics department wanted Furlong to make a fundraising speech last winter, she let the university know she disagreed. She raised the allegations that were made in court. It's not a free speech issue. Uh, it's about making money for the university, uh, using the reputation of somebody who's well known, and his reputation is uh, affected. UBC immediately rescinded the invitation, only to change its mind weeks later in an embarrassing flip-flop and invite Furlong back something Kirkmeyer opposed. In her opinion, UBC ignored the allegations. The university shouldn't want to associate with somebody like that. The decision to pay Furlong to speak at the university sparked two demonstrations. When we found out that John Furlong was being reinstated as keynote speaker for the athletic fundraiser, um, we started talking about it and um, wanted to do something. Emily Bailey was one of the protest organizers. In her opinion, Furlong's former students did not get their day in court. We just wanted to be um, really clear about that relationship that we believe survivors and, and the kind of danger that's associated when we choose not to believe um, people. In the Wedge decision, those allegations relate to physical and verbal abuse former students say they experienced. The judge knew about those students, but they didn't testify in her courtroom. Furlong wrote in his Olympic memoir, Patriot Hearts, that he came to Canada from Ireland as a Catholic missionary. He said he worked as a phys ed teacher in northern BC. He said he came to Canada in 1974. My time in Burns Lake was fairly brief. Some UBC alumni came to Furlong's defense. These email records obtained through a Freedom of Information request show many of them pressured UBC to reinstate his speech, or they would stop their donations. In Bailey's opinion, the decision to re-invite Furlong was a denial of the students' allegations. It was very disheartening when, you know, those that are in power that actually have the ability to make posit a positive impact for a community choose not to. Furlong was never charged with a crime. 
But for some students and faculty members in Vancouver, a cloud seems to hang over his head. To whom is UBC accountable? UBC is accountable to angry rich people who decide that they uh, need to have, they're going to come to the defense of one of their own. And they don't see Indigenous people as one of our own community. And, you know, I don't have a fancy analysis, that's just what I think. The RCMP and Prince George, B.C. investigated the allegations of abuse from 40 years ago. They concluded there wasn't enough evidence for charges to be laid. What happened sparked an investigation, a review, and complaints about the Mounties' work. But no one here would speak to us about it on camera. Robinson filed a complaint about this, wondering why the former students were let down. They had to put their faith in the judicial system and in Canadians in general that when they heard their story, they were going to do something. And instead, the wagon circled around Furlong. This confirmation letter from the RCMP Civilian Review and Complaints Commission arrived while we were at her home in Ontario. The former students also complained about the RCMP investigation to the Canadian Human Rights Commission. Come on. Kathy Woodgate is one of those former students from Burns Lake. She was surprised by how some media outlets reported the Furlong story. One guy phoned and said, do you, uh, do you, he asked me something. And I said, do you want an interview with any of us? And he says, not at this time. And he hung up. So we don't want to hear from you, but can you tell me a bit about why you did this to John for long? And was the, what I got out of it. Seeing the protests at UBC buoyed her spirits. Thank you for making that circle around that building. I'm so proud of you. you that is so, uh, so great. Everyone was aware that there was controversy surrounding Mr. Furlong. Professor Link Kessler is senior advisor to UBC President Santa Ono on Aboriginal affairs. He was called on during the Furlong protest. And so did he ask your opinion? Yes. Okay. And did you share it? I did. Okay. And that opinion was? I am not going to discuss my communications with the president. Kessler won't say how he sees things, but he says UBC remains committed to reconciliation. And the history of Indigenous people in Canada, even in the educational institutions such as this one, has, has been suppressed. It is not information that people have been given access to, and we are changing that. He says the subject of residential school strikes a personal chord with him. I spoke to you earlier about my mother's experience in a boarding school. This is not a trivial matter to me. This is something I've been thinking about in one way or another my entire life. Kessler says he talked with Laura Robinson and spoke to some of the former students. When I was made aware that people had written letters to the uh, president's office, I contacted them. I had discussions with them. I told them what I'm telling you about what we are doing. I assured them that I understood their concerns and their position. What do you think it did to the relationship with the indigenous community? And well, I think, uh, I think the reaction among uh, people that I spoke to, uh, among indigenous community members, was varied. Uh, it was not completely uniform. There was some fallout. One indigenous member quit the president's advisory committee on Aboriginal affairs, and the only indigenous professor on the sexual assault policy committee stepped down. Bringing John Furlong is fundamentally against reconciliation. Bailey says it's only yeah. fair people hear both sides of the story. So every time I've had conversations with folks who don't know who John Furlong is, don't know about the history or um, 
maybe even what it means to be a settler or you know on unceded land they always grow in their understanding very concerned Excitement was building in the lead-up to the Olympic Games. John Furlong was all over the news. But in northern BC, former student Dorothy Williams was feeling anxious. Seeing his face on TV upset her. It's something journalist Laura Robinson took note of. When people tell you something and they really can barely tell you the story, Justice Wedge even mentioned it in her decision, noticing Robinson was talking about it in some of her emails, including to the mayor of Vancouver, the host city of the Olympics. John Furlong no longer lives here in Burns Lake, and the original school's been torn down. But for the students who remain, they say they can't shake what happened here, and that's why they're pushing so hard for reconciliation. Wedge considered Robinson's investigation, noting the reporter made several trips to Burns Lake, and that was important. Students did not come to Robinson. She went to them, the judge said, to interview people and pick up affidavits from former residential school students. I feel affidavits are really strong evidence, and all of these people knew that it was a criminal offense to say uh, anything uh, untrue in, a, in an affidavit. But APTN Investigates has been told affidavits without testimony in person are not admissible as evidence at a trial, and the former students have not testified in court. Of course, what is reported in the media has a different test than in court, but it hasn't helped the former students get the justice they say they deserve. Yeah, I, of course I wouldn't do the story if I didn't believe them. Wedge concluded Robinson developed a working hypothesis that Furlong was guilty and repeated it to others as she gathered information for her story in 2012. The judge ruled against Robinson in the defamation case. Really, it was, uh, for me, I understood what the word gutted means. Robinson says the judge's opinion shattered her faith in civil society. And uh, I've had this crisis of faith, you know, like I, I, um, I completely understand her. I believed in the judge. She lodged a complaint against the judge with the Canadian Judicial Council, alleging Wedge made more than 50 errors in her written decision. The council told APTN Investigates it rejected the complaint. We asked Furlong for an interview, but he declined all requests we made through his lawyer and spokesperson. We received this statement instead, saying he'd been exonerated. We are counsel to Mr. Furlong and write in response to your request for comment about allegations of abuse made by persons who were interviewed by Laura Robinson. Mr. Furlong has consistently stated that he is innocent of the alleged abuse and each allegation that has been subject to investigation by the RCMP or finding of the courts has been found to be unsubstantiated. But not everyone agrees with that interpretation, including former students. These court documents show Furlong had one conversation with Prince George RCMP. He said he never strapped or hit any of the students or witnessed them being strapped. He said he was a vocal coach but never pushed or abused the kids. When police asked why he didn't mention Burns Lake in his Olympic memoir, Furlong said it wasn't relevant to the story he wanted to tell, and there wasn't room. Why did John Furlong not reveal that he came to Canada as a Catholic missionary? And does he think that if people knew he had worked at a residential school as a missionary, that that would have impacted his chances of becoming CEO of the Vancouver Olympics. Someone who was with Furlong in Burns Lake also spoke to police, his first wife. The woman says she didn't see Furlong abuse any students. 
she does say children were strapped at the school. The RCMP Major Crime Unit in Edmonton formally reviewed the initial furlong investigation. It made these 28 recommendations, including the suggestion that furlong be given a lie detector test. But we don't know if that happened because the RCMP won't discuss the case. Former students are now taking drastic action. The survivors have appealed to the Prime Minister to appoint a special investigator to review their allegations and take them out of the hands of the Mounties. They say that would give them the sober second look they so badly want and the clout they feel they deserve. It's a gutsy move supported by the Assembly of First Nations in Ottawa, which has endorsed it through a resolution, as a way to clear up, in their opinion, the mistaken impression that a judge has ruled on all the allegations. Robinson plans to explain that in the book she's writing about the case. I can't imagine not writing a book about this. She says she still has more questions than answers about how a teacher came to lead the games. And why, he says, he came to Canada in 1974, when she reported he arrived in 1969. Of course it's shocking, first of all, uh, that, uh, that the CEO of an Olympics came to Canada as a missionary and worked at a residential school. We know that. That's shocking. And it's also shocking to see that, why isn't he ever talking about any of this? Why isn't anyone asking about this? But Furlong is unlikely to give her an interview because he believes Robinson has a vendetta against him, something Wedge appears to agree with. Writing, Ms. Robinson initiated the investigation and set its parameters, solicited the statements after telegraphing the purpose of her investigation, and then published the contents of the statements in her articles for her own purposes. Robinson says she doesn't have a vendetta. She says she's used to being criticized for making a career of pointing out problems in sport, including the Olympics. It's very easy to label women as vendetta-seeking bitches or crazy women or whatever it is that they need to say we are, when in fact we've done our research and we're talking about real issues in sport. In the meantime, she has expanded her complaint about the RCMP, after learning some senior Mounties in northern BC worked closely with Furlong on Olympic security issues. They didn't reveal that they had a past business relationship with John Furlong, mm -hmm. and in fact, many of the RCMP, because there were 4,000 of them working at the Olympics, do have a past relationship, maybe not with John Furlong, but with Vanoff. They could not be part of an investigation of this man, and they were. So they didn't recuse themselves. Robinson says the story has cost her her reputation. And she discovered the Mounties have put her name on their domestic terror list. To a center, the National Operations Center, and when I looked it up, it's to do with terrorism and na national disasters. Why is a journalist, a journalist who's doing her job being reported to the NOC? She has also had health problems. I have really serious digestive problems. And difficulty finding work. It silenced me, yeah. It definitely silenced me. The furlong controversy has also left a mark on UBC. This room, uh, we're calling it our elders' room, where the Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Centre is poised to educate future generations. We have worked very hard to establish that centre so that the history will not be forgotten. The experiences of people who went through the, you know, the residential schools will be known and available. And as we do that, we are developing the capability of many more people to evaluate issues and come to good decisions about things. Next week on APTN Investigates. Sydney Gladue's name should not be ever, ever forgotten. Well, we called it our breaking point. 
because this just spread like wildfire. The way she was treated and the verdict of the case is a symptom of systemic racism that needs to be addressed in our country. You know, with its verdict of an acquittal, sent a message to Indigenous women and to sex workers that their lives are not valued. You know, it's basically sending a message of impunity, that it is okay to kill an Indigenous woman or to kill a sex worker and walk away free. We're amazed and surprised and so happy about that because finally the word was getting out that we've been trying to um, articulate all these years. Here's what's left of the Nanette Tuberculosis Sanatorium just south of Winnipeg, Manitoba. It's hard to believe it's now a private residence. Once thousands of Indigenous patients were sent here in the 1940s and 50s. But the sanatorium board and the staff at Nanette were prepared to tackle a big problem. And over the years, new forces and resources came to their aid. Expanding facilities resulted in the construction of the... And one of them was Gerald McIver's brother, Michael. Throughout his 50, the 50 years of uh, his life, my brother uh, shared experiences with me of uh, him really questioning the fact whether he had TB or not, and also uh, sharing details of uh, the medical experimentation that was conducted at the Nainet Sanatorium upon him and other indigenous children. They didn't know when they died, and they didn't know when they were buried, and they know the records exist, and no one will tell them. Among our native population is largely attributable to earlier diagnosis, isolation, and sanatorium treatment. These surveys reach out to reserves along the lakes and rivers, and deep in the forests of the north, bringing the benefits of modern science to the people in these remote areas. Diagnosis and treatment of tuberculosis among the Indian is a joint effort, but some apparently healthy person in that crowd may unknowingly have tuberculosis. To me, the hospitals were 100% worse because they could do the shock treatment. They could do it, and they didn't have to. Remember, this is the 40s till the 60s. Up until the 40s, no records were kept. 